Welcome to another edition of Front Row Material and Future Stars Now. I am Mike Freeland. I am joined, as always, by my dear personal longtime friend. His name is... The Rit. Rit, it's good to see you, my friend. How you been? Uh, not bad. I can't really complain. It's been a, been a very tiring week. But uh, here we are back at it, Tuesday night, 8 it. Yeah, I was going to say 8 a.m. Good Lord. <laughs> no, no, we're, this isn't pre-recorded. It's it's 8 p.m. and we're on Future Stars now. And, man, we got one hell of a guest that is going to compete with my collection tonight, as I see. He yeah. is it, it, he's an amazing uh, wrestler, an amazing deathmatch competitor. And I can't wait for this one. Yeah, I'm excited about this as well. I mean, it's it's not often we get to dip our toes into this type of genre with wrestling, but I feel like it's becoming a lot more popular recently, and I'm excited. Can't wait to ask a ton of questions about this, and uh, it's it's going to be a wild ride. So let's let's have some fun. So so what you're saying is I should apologize to him before we even start. Uh, you might just want to have one in the back of your mind, just just ready to go, just in case. Okay. But, uh, hey, but you know what? Here's the beauty. We get to be a part of a deathmatch uh, interview, but we don't have any light tubes uh, slammed on us. How does that feel? Hey, I could probably have Meg find a couple for you. You don't need to start that. You don't need to start that. Trust me, she could find any weapon in this place and turn it into a deathmatch. And trust me, I've been on the, the receiving end of what could be described loosely as a deathmatch in our house, depending on what it is that I did or didn't do. Okay. Well, let's, uh, without further ado, let's bring in Mr. Alex Colon. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Oh, man. We're excited. How you doing tonight, Alex? Uh, I'm all right. I'm all right. Um, just got done the shoot, so I'm here hanging out, and I'm uh, glad to be on with you guys. So, I I'm Rit and I were talking about this. I mean, obviously, looking at your studio right there, holy... Yeah. Holy cow. Only half of it. <laughs> that, that is a wide variety of collectibles. And how long have you been doing this, collecting? Maybe a year. I had a couple friends in the wrestling community really get me into it. And uh, it's just gotten out of control. <laughs> I can't stop. It's bad. It's, it's literally bad. So in the last year, obviously, you've been collecting. What would you yeah. say was the very first thing that you picked up off the shelf Ooh. and said, this is the beginning. Yeah. And the significant other said, this is the beginning. Yeah, I don't know. Now, now you're asking me a question. I'm not even, I don't even know. I have so much. It's crazy. Hey. I don't, I, I wish I had a really good answer for you guys, but I literally have so much stuff in here. Like, I don't even know how I would uh, go about that. Man, if you think, if you think that's a hard question, you wait till the closer. Yeah. Yeah, I have so much stuff in here. Um, I wanted, I can't really point out one thing. Uh, I have a bunch of elites and stuff, so I didn't start too, too long ago. Um, I could give you one of my favorite things in here, honestly, right now, if, if that makes for consolation. But Sure. Uh, I have a Hulk Hogan, but this isn't an authentic Hulk Hogan. This is uh, one from Mexico. It's a bootleg that I got on, on the streets of Mexico uh, when I did a little tour of Mexico not too long ago. Um, they had some really big flea market. It was like a whole block was a flea market. And um, I seen this just sitting in the back, uh, in the back of a bunch of crap. And I was like, oh. So I started asking the guy, like, oh, how much? You know, obviously, I know a little bit of Spanish. I was like, cuanto, cuanto eso? And then he let me know it was like 10 American dollars. I was like, yup. I already wow. knew. I was like, man, this thing is crazy. It's like they make bootleg figures like wild in Mexico. And, and believe it or not, Alex, bootlegs actually have their own genre of collecting. So mm -hmm. it, it is really very, very uh, authentic. And it's very exciting to be able to find some of these because depending on where you are in the world, those things are just as valuable, if not more, than the authentic ones because they're so rare you can't really find them all the places. Agreed. You're right. right. And, and they're Jerry, like one of a kind, you know. And, and didn't Jerry say he who was it, psychosis or Hoobentoot? He used to pay him the, the when he went down to Mexico to get his boots because they're they're better quality and cheaper made. Yeah, there's I material. Think, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, Mike, but there's materials in uh, Mexico that you can't get in the states. So that's why a lot of guys get their stuff done in Mexico because there's a bunch of 
different styles of materials and stuff that they use over there. And for a look, obviously the cost is really low compared to the U S um, there's stuff over there that we can't get over here. It's, it's nuts. Yeah. I think it was, um, now that I'm thinking about it here, I think it was super crazy. Um, yeah, super crazy would go down there and he would actually take orders from people. And, uh, obviously he and Jerry became good friends and he was like, Hey man, he goes, what are you paying for your gear? And I think Jerry told him whatever it was. And he goes, no, 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 no. You're overpaying. He said, all right, well, next time you go down, he said, you know, I'll give you X amount of money and what can you get? And I think he said he got, Jerry said he got two pairs of boots. He said, and they were so well-made. He goes, I wore them for the majority of my end of my WWF run and into my TNA run. And he goes, it was great. I loved them. That's awesome. So, I mean, obviously, uh, talking about your collection of action figures, you're a, you're a very interesting individual. I mean, very well-spoken, great collector of wrestling figures. Um, when it came to wrestling, what was it about wrestling that really started to pique your interest? Like, you know, why, why pro wrestling at the end of the day? What was it that really made you say, you know what, this could be something I could see myself doing? Uh, probably the characters, um, some of my earliest memories of wrestling, um, as a child, I was, I was, I come from a, a poor family. At least they were poor at the time. Um, my, me, my mother and my stepfather lived with, with a, a friend of theirs or whatnot. Cause we were in hard times at that point in life. It was very small. And, um, on Saturday, Saturday afternoons, as you guys were, if you guys would remember on Fox TV, at least in the East coast, Fox TV at 12 o'clock would be WWF superstars. So I would I would watch morning cartoons and then uh, at twelve o'clock uh, superstars would start and that's when I would uh, catch a lot of wrestling. That was during the new generation. So the characters were a big draw in and even I saw some stuff even before then like Hogan and Warrior. But like the new generation is really when I got into wrestling, and um, that's kind of what drew me in. You know, I call myself having to watch it in this little black and white TV with an antenna and all the boomers are looking at me like, oh look at this old man. <laughs> black and white with the antenna but yeah that's how i literally caught wrestling and uh it just caught my eye and it stayed with me for a long time you know uh all through my adolescence uh when i got into high school like just like everybody else you kind of get out of it a little bit because you're into sports and girls and whatnot but uh a little bit afterwards uh going towards the end of high school i got right back into it and it was almost like it never left me who would you say was somebody who i mean you liked all the characters but was there anybody yeah. who you gravitated towards uh, at that time, you thought, man, I really like if this person's on, I really got to catch it. Yeah, uh, my favorite wrestler of all time, Bret Hart. Nice. <laughs> uh, one of my fondest memories is that commercial where uh, Bret's walking down the hallway and the little kid's like, Bret! And he turns around. Oh, my God. It just it brings back so many memories. But I'm a huge diehard Bret Hart fan. And um, I would avidly watch all his stuff. And I would beg uh, my mom at the time to, to get the pay-per-view so I could watch all oh, uh, Brett's in the Royal Rumble. It's like 94. It's crazy. Like, uh, I was just really into it that bad where I would beg to watch these pay-per-views. And at the time you would have to call the service provider. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they would hook it up into your TV. It was wild. Crazy times. I mean, outside of the black box, but we won't talk about the illegal ways. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, speaking of illegal stuff, ECW, when did you uh, first get a glimpse of ECW being on the East Coast? Uh, Man, I actually caught glimpses a, a little bit of when they were Eastern because it was all on Channel 20 in Jersey. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm from South Jersey, so, like, it was very local to me. Um, and and I was like, oh, what's this? And I really didn't watch it too much because they were splitting time, I think, with NWA or something would be on public access, too, to some degree. I don't know if that was Dennis Corluzzo or who it was, but they yeah. kind of split that time frame. And um, at some point, like, I'm saying mid-'90s, uh, I started catching it again, and that's when I seen, like, Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, Too Cold Scorpio, like, all the wrestlers. And I was like, oh, this is this is awesome. But then they also had the hardcore stuff, like Tommy Dreamer, Sandman, Raven. Um, and I got really into it for a while, and then I lost track of it, and then it came kind of back again in the late 90s for a little bit. But I really didn't get to watch really the full library until after they were already defunct. Uh, you know, when you're growing up and you're – you're uh, getting older, like you kind of fall out of love with certain things and, and maybe they come back and they go away for a while. So that's how it kind of was with ECW. ECW also was, 
very different than probably what you were watching on WWF Superstars. It was it was more grungy. It was more uh, underground. Um, I've you've often used the phrase very Fight Club esque. It was stuff that you weren't really quite sure if you were supposed to be watching because it didn't really feel like what you were used to watching with pro wrestling. A lot of guys who who didn't quite look like pro wrestlers. They looked like a guy that could be working somewhere, you know, anywhere. And all of a sudden they get in there and they start mixing it up and it gets violent and bloody. Um, what would you say was the, was the big draw as far as ECW goes? Because they had a great Lucha Libre in there before really anybody was really focusing on that. I think Paul did that really well. But then they had the great tag teams and then all these different unique people like Sabu and Sandman and all that. So who kind of stood out to you when it comes to the ECW crew? The ECW crew, uh, I think Sabu to me was the number one guy that stood out to me, especially when I first started watching. Um, and Sabu was really like people were – just talking about him like who's this who's this crazy dude with these glittery pants and like he has scars <laughs> everywhere and it, it i was into it and then he's doing moonsaults on table tables for no reason just just doing it i was like yo this guy's off the hook i need to watch this as much as possible and the sad part is ecw didn't come on until like 12 o'clock one o'clock in the morning and yep. a lot of times on fridays so like i'd go through the school week and I tr do my best to stay up until one in the morning, hoping to, to get a uh, uh, ECW or a rerun. Like, so I could watch some of these obscure dudes. And, and I wasn't, I wasn't shy of the, the scene because I knew who guys like uh surfer Ray Odyssey, a lot of the, uh, the crew from like Taz's, uh, Taz's group of guys, like Johnny rods, the Johnny rod school guys, because they all traveled through South Jersey and North Jersey. So, any, every now and then I would see posters for these guys in, in different towns in South Jersey because there's independent shows running everywhere. So I wasn't it wasn't like I didn't know who certain people were, but like the ECW crew is just like a whole nother breed of people. And like, yeah, Sabu was just one of the guys that really stood out to me. And I think he influenced a lot of people, not just me. So, eh. the, so what made you decide, hey, you know, I want to try this? Uh, I, I had... It was like towards the end of high school um me and one of my friends we were real tight and he he ended up uh him and one of his closer friends got into backyard wrestling and that's odd because i'm late in high school so that's kind of like usually that's stuff that you do earlier in your uh, grade school and adolescence um and we all linked up and they just really got me into it i think it was just just a culmination of your friends and you want to do stupid stuff you don't have anything else to do and i'm kind of from a smaller town uh, so we didn't have much to do but just go into his backyard and and try to beat each other up. And everybody there was huge wrestling fans. I was I was a huge wrestling fan as well, you know. So um, we did, it just kind of gelled and uh, it just spiraled. And then we met a whole another crew of guys. They got a hold of a wrestling ring and it just continued to just ante up, ante up. And then that's when the whole dynamic of uh, one of our friends worked with uh, Lobo from CZW mm -hmm. fame. And um, he came to one of our backyard shows. The next thing you know, oh, the CCW is opening up a school again. Uh, you guys should come. I'll talk to Zandig about you guys. And you guys should be the first new class in, and he'll train you guys. And then that it kind of spiraled. It was crazy. It went real fast, real fast, too. That's Your story is really interesting because, you know, we've talked to so many people on the show. And backyard wrestling, I guess, was more popular than I actually gave it credit for because – a lot of people said that they did that. Uh, either they had a makeshift ring or they started holding shows uh, in the backyards and whatnot. And that's where they knew somebody who knew somebody. And eventually, you know, word gets around that you're interested and then you get introduced to somebody. So CZW, in my opinion, was obviously the company that kind of carried the torch after ECW ended. They were more of the the real rough and tough and guys that would take a lot of risks that a lot of other people wouldn't do, which turned out to make for amazing matches. Um, you mentioned John Zandig. What was your relationship with John the first time you met him? Uh, John's a very uh, keep to himself type of person. It wasn't really much of a, relation, of a relationship other than, you know, him just talking to us and kind of like um, – grooming to bring us in like hey guys like this is czw you know uh you guys come I, obviously he tried to play more of a, of a father figure but from a distance it's like he's there he's the boss you know 
He's the guy who's going to help us get in, you know, and he gave us a lot of opportunities, but like, he wasn't really as like close to us as guys like maybe our, our trainers like John Dahmer and DJ Hyde. And then we had tons of like ruckus, uh, you know, uh, Black G's who was Sabian at the time and Joker. A lot of those local like Philly guys were there. And what a lot of people don't know is like when I first started training, uh, I started training with Tommy Cairo and um, a guy by the name of White Lotus. And then kind of when CCW finally really started, that's when I kind of flipped over. So people don't know that I had a lot of older school style of training before i got into czw at least a couple months of it yeah czw like you had a great career there at czw like i'm just i was just looking at at the tournament you won uh Mm -hmm. best of the best 12 in 2013 yeah that like if you look at that tournament like that's some of the great who's who's of now you know you had jonathan gresham Mm -hmm. alex reynolds rich swan a.r fox Tommy End, and your of course yourself was in there. It's like, man, like if you were to get that tournament now, like that's a that's a pay per view caliber right there. Yeah, but that's yeah. a seventy dollar people would pay to see that right there. It's a it's a TV, it's a TV pay per view. You're absolutely right, isn't it? Man, what did I do with my life, guys? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I apologize. You're here uh, getting interviewed by us. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, we uh we we don't really uh, answer a whole lot of questions. I mean, we get a lot of them when we're out and about. But <laughs> yeah. um, so it's so exciting to hear about this because when you say John Zanding, and I think there's always a lot of question marks around him because, like you said before, not exactly the person who jumps out when it comes to memorable quotes or somebody that you've heard a lot of things from. And you also mentioned DJ Hyde as well. So obviously we know DJ Hyde then went ahead and he branched off and he kind of did his thing as well. What was it like working with and getting to talk to DJ Hyde at that time as well? Uh, at the time he was, he was a real, like he really um did, uh, did his best, I guess, to help us. You know, I always felt like, and this is my personal opinion. I always felt like he had his, he had his doubts here and there because I guess uh, being a, a, a father figure of sorts, um, he didn't. He didn't always want to let the leash too let go like too long. You know what I mean? If that makes any sense. Yeah. Um. But he gave us as many opportunities as he possibly could. At least at, when he was the boss. Even when he wasn't the boss, he was always kind of like pitching for us to do stuff. You know, and it did nothing but but help guys like me and Joe Gacy, Adam Cole, guys who were really there trying to grind and get somewhere. Um. That was kind of his role. Like he was a head trainer. He was one of the head trainers. Um. And you know, I have. I will always have respect for DJ. It's like, I wish he would have like let the leash go a little bit, but like role wise, like he was almost, he was a little bit more of a fatherly guy, uh, more so than Zandig, but you know, like he had his ups and his negatives and positives or whatnot. So I, I can't really comment too, too much about it. So I want to say it is somewhere in Pennsylvania where they have that crazy, insane, Death match. Uh, where exactly is that at? That's, it's it's like in a big field. That's, that's oh, Maryland. Uh, Delaware. Maryland. Delaware. 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 Okay. Yeah. So I watched a documentary on that, and there are legitimate, dedicated fans that, I mean, it's almost like their version of, um, oh my gosh, I'm trying to think of here, Woodstock in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they come from all over the East Coast and in some places, even even in the Midwest, to come and see something like this. So when it when there's a vibe for a feel like that for an event, what was your thoughts originally when you heard the concept of that? Well, when the, the original uh, concept, I actually uh, – I didn't say I watched it, but at, at one point CCW had Fake U TV, which was their kind of hard – ECW Hardcore TV – which would play on uh, public access. So when ECW faded away, CZW kind of came into that time slot. And uh, I th- I just randomly, like, clicking through the channels, fell into it. And um, that's where I seen, like, uh, Best of the Best was one of the first uh, commercially things I seen. They, they did these little commercials in between, in between their segments. And uh, Tournament of Death was one. So then somehow I got a hold of Tournament of Death, and that's where I, like, first seen the whole Tournament of Death concept. And then eventually it evolved to where they started running in Delaware, for the most part. So that's kind of how, uh, how I stumbled upon that whole thing. 
I don't know too, too much about it, about the origins and stuff of it, but, uh, you know, it was a John Zandig branded idea and, uh, it was just bringing a big deathmatch tournament into the States because uh, the States had the, you, Ian Rotten had his thing going on in the Midwest, but at, when it came to East coast and it came to like a more violent style, like nothing was really out this way in, in the East coast. Um, in terms of that. So like tournament of death was kind of really the first of its own. Did any of that kind of make you take a step back and say, it's might be a little too extreme or did you feel like, no, even though it kind of has that appearance, everything is very much under control at all times. No. Uh, the, the fact that it was out of control was what drew people like me to it, because I don't know if that's just what the generation of the late nineties was into, but like, you know, alternative music, you know, people are dressing in black. There, People are just doing wild things. You know, drugs are rampant in a, a young social community. Um, and that's just the kind of thing that, that I, at least I was into, my friends were into. We wanted something other than what we seen on TV, which was, which was little kid characters and just hokey stuff. Like, ah, come on, this is. This doesn't it doesn't resonate with a teenage crowd. What resonates with a teenage crowd is obscure things like like guys hitting each other with light bulbs. It's just it's the shock factor probably that really drew me and a lot of other teenagers at the time in. So during your training here, um, yeah. at what point just to kind of educate me, at what point does the the more extreme and deathmatch stuff start to come into the equation? Is it more of standard wrestling school and then at the very end they say hey this is what we this is what our moniker is this is what we're known or how, do they weave that into the the training regiment as well is there any introduction of that there there really is no intro introduction deathmatch wrestling is as i tell people it's something that you get into and you learn along the way like you don't you're never really told there's a certain way to do things until you wrestle somebody who kind of has an idea of what to do and they, they kind of lead you along. And, it, you know, it falls under, like, old-school type of training where, like, you know, guys in the Midwest, you, you, guys like, let's say, Legion of Doom, they, they had a basic style of training uh, from Eddie Sharkey. And then, like, as, long as they would go along the way and they would work territories. And then people who were older, who were more in the business, the veterans, would teach them more stuff. So same thing with Deathmatch Wrestling. Like, you get – you know your basic wrestling stuff. You get in and – uh it's trial by fire. You learn, you learn by your errors and then people will teach you a couple things. And then you just collect all that data until like it becomes a part of your whole repertoire. It's, it was never a thing in, in wrestling school. Like CZW didn't bring me and said, Hey, Hey, this is what deathmatch wrestling is. They brought me in and said, Hey, we're going to teach you how to wrestle. We're not going to teach you how to deathmatch. That's something you have to decide to do if that's what you want to do at some point and you'll learn it along the way. It's not something we teach you here. Speaking of what you kind of mentioned before about, you know, you start to pick up little nuggets of information here and there from people as you continue to travel and you continue to hone your craft. Who were some early uh, influential people that you got a chance to talk to and they said, hey, man, you know, try this or do that or I like what you're doing, but you might want to dabble in doing this or this is how you could do this a little bit better. Who in the deathmatch world um, per se took you under their wing? Uh, guys like the Naptown Dragons. There's a, a guy by the name of Brain Damage. Unfortunately, he passed away years ago. Um, he was a, a real big influence. A very nice guy. Um, you know, would always give us the best advice possible. Just keep your head down, keep working, you know, keep grinding, pay your dues. Um, you know, and we'd always have, like, the older school guys would come in. You'd see maybe a Sabu or, or a Spike Dudley on one of the shows just randomly. And they'd you'd ask them for advice, and they'd give you the best advice possible. Uh, deathmatch wise, like a lot of people kind of kept to themselves, uh, as a younger crew, we were, we were like more so supposed, supposed to be, or we were more so geared to focus on, uh, the wrestling aspect more than the deathmatch aspect. But, you know, uh, a bunch of those guys did their best to give us any little knowledge they could, but at the very beginning, it was primarily, uh, just wrestling data more so than deathmatch data, the deathmatch stuff, at least for me came way later on when I already, uh, you know, spent many years as just a professional wrestler solely. When you were, we were training, did you guys ever, did they ever have the students go to shows as well or uh, observe or help out or how did that all work out? Yeah. Um, 
So, so we were basically the, the cleanup crew. We were the setup crew. So we would be the guys sweeping up and mopping up the glass and blood. Uh, we'd be helping pick up people, you know, the common pay or do set up the ring, tear down the ring. We'd be there for the big, like cage of death shows. We'd be there till, till all hours of the day. Like I remember times where we were there till four in the morning and then go home, come back for, for the show the next day, like midday, 12 o'clock. Um, and then obviously stay for cleanup because you have to set up and then to tear down. Um, so we did, we did basically everything we were asked to everything that a normal young boy in the business does is. Uh, and then just on top of that, with the ultraviolet stuff, is is cleaning up uh, all the mess that is left afterwards, and it's usually a pretty big mess to clean up. As you were training and and seeing some of this, um, do you have any memories that stand out as you were uh, watching some of these things? Like, oh my god, I can't believe they just did this, or I can't believe he just got hurt this way. Anything that kind of like you know stands out in your mind is. Uh, a holy shit moment, not to steal a catchphrase, but. <laughs> uh, I, I've seen a lot of those. Um, I recall one time uh, John Zandig sending Joker off the top of one of the cage of deaths. He gorilla pressed him and uh, sent him off onto a table that was like in full fire, full, fully engulfed in flames. And um, for whatever reason, I was like, oh, I just can't believe people do that. Um, I think I was at the one show where Nick Gage literally died for uh, eight seconds, which was the craziest thing ever because no one really knew what was going on. And then you see this helicopter coming off to airlift them away. Uh, and then later on, we came to find out that he literally died and came back to life. Uh, very crazy things. But I think I've seen so much stuff throughout the 15 years I've been wrestling, at least from a deathmatch perspective, that it's so hard to really pick out one moment because – I see a crazy moment every month of the year. Was there ever a point in time, and, and there may have been, you might not have publicly said it to anybody else, but in your own mind said to yourself, um, I'm having second thoughts. May maybe I need to do more of the traditional stuff that I saw with the WWF type of guys. Uh, all the time. Because uh, being a deathmatch wrestler, at least being labeled a deathmatch wrestler, because – I'll consider myself that because that's what I'm primarily doing right now. That's what I do from a weekly to weekly basis. Um, I won't say unfortunately, sometimes I do, uh, you know, as a deathmatch wrestler, you tend to struggle because you, you, uh, you come into the business to be a professional wrestler and you kind of lean towards this style because you just gravitate towards it. And, it, and then for me, it just, it fit me. And uh, it's kind of, I guess it's kind of the X factor that a lot of promoters would say, Hey, Alex, we know you can wrestle but you're missing, there's something missing. There's an X factor missing. And then when I started doing death matches, for whatever reason, a lot of things started clicking, like character wise, uh, just being more aggressive and, and learning a different side of me. Uh, I guess it gravitated towards fans and then uh, promoters and bookers obviously like hopped on the bandwagon. We're like, yeah, this is who you are. So I, I kind of figured, I guess that was my X factor. So, um, you know, uh, I, I struggle all the time because I come from 10 years of just straight professional wrestling and then the last five to six years, or five going into six, have been uh, solely primarily uh, death matches. So it's always a struggle because a part of me wants to be more than what I am. But in deathmatch wrestling, a lot of people say, oh, there's there's no ceiling. There is a ceiling like because the style we do isn't isn't geared to appeal towards a TV crowd per se. It's, it's more so like how ECW in the 90s was geared towards indie wrestling crowds, like the, a very niche sector. So it's just a it's a battle, at least personally for me, that I go through even to this day. Well, in the past five or six years in deathmatch wrestling, you have had some phenomenal matches. Uh, in GCW, you were the only person to win the tournament of survival, not just three times, but three consecutive years. Yeah. Like, that has to be a great accomplishment. You know, in 2019... Your uh, the finals was a four way. 2020, you went went up against uh, Ricky Shane Page, and then 2021, you went up against Atticus. Mm -hmm. So it's like you, it. Your uh, people like say this is your X factor, but you do it and you do it well, and you go and you bring it up to a different level. You know, every time you go out there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's it's obviously what I do well. So I don't, I'll never deny 
uh, you know, being a deathmatch wrestler because it's what I do do well. But at least in my own personal opinion, at some point in life, I'd like for people to be like, he was a good professional wrestler, not just a deathmatch wrestler. That's great. But it, at least coming from my perspective, it's just about encompassing the whole uh, around thing, you know. But deathmatch wrestling is a big part of my life. And, you know, the fans love me for what I do. And I love the fans for loving me for what I do. Uh, especially coming out of the pandemic, uh, I would love to get your thoughts on uh, Matt Cordona, how he <laughs> how he helped, you know, get more eyes on deathmatch wrestling. And I, I would love to get your thoughts on, uh, on him, you know, dipping his toe in deathmatch wrestling and, and what he's uh, done to try to help out, you know, the indie product as a whole. Yeah, um, you know, uh, not too many people from a TV aspect even think about at least what we do. Um, it, like, like we we were saying, it's very niche. Uh, it's not it's not in the wheelhouse of anybody from more of a TV background. He's from more of a TV background. He was kind of bred and groomed into that style. You know, for him to come into a deathmatch style, like it did bring a lot of eyes. Like he's a guy who has a lot of social media presence. Everyone knows him from his podcast, his little YouTube show. Um, you know, and he he has a big voice uh, in the wrestling community uh, amongst. TV fans, indie fans, podcasting fans, so uh, that could only bring good. And granted, a lot of the a lot of the diehards in GCW hate Matt Cardona for uh, just being who he is, but they can't deny the fact that he really helped bring a whole new audience into the deathmatch genre. Because there's a lot of people who who watched guys like me on that same show where he wrestled Nick Gage and said, "Oh, who's this guy? This guy's awesome," you know. And it brought a lot of new eyes to to what I'm doing and to what other guys are doing. That's only a positive from here on out. It seems like we're getting a lot more people who are working in the deathmatch scene. I mean, obviously we saw, you know, Nick Gage t tends to be that guy that a lot of people put in there whenever they think of that. Um, Nick Gage versus David Arquette. And then obviously Nick Gage gets on AEW Dynamite in a big match with Chris Jericho. Obviously he was feuding with, uh, Matt Cardona, um, Suzuki is actually going to be going uh, into the yeah. death match, and he's going to. So it's really interesting now that you're seeing so many of these different people. Like, like Rit said before, they're bringing a lot of attention um, to this, and they're bringing their name recognition and their fan base, and they're you know kind of highlighting this, and people are getting exposed even more to a genre that they might not have seen. Obviously, they can see people like you and all the other kinds of people, and they can say, oh, my gosh, now I want to be a fan of this person. It's what gets you in the door, but it's what keeps you coming back is what you mm -hmm. see during the show. Yeah, it, and it's it falls under when CCW first started after that whole the whole ECW era because it was hardcore. Then you go to this era that's ultra-violence, and um, it, there's a boom, and that's what I feel like is going on right now. It's a big like resurgence for deathmatch wrestling. It's a big boom, and a lot of people who don't even know what deathmatch wrestling is, they're finding it. Just like the people who found all those uh, FMW tapes, the wing tapes. Like, it, how many fans spawned from watching Hayabusa, watching Onita? Like, how many people became fans of Japanese wrestling just from watching that stuff? Like all the explosion stuff. Like. And there's people who aren't wrestling fans who, who still be like, oh, man, I've seen this Japanese tape online from uh, a download off of LimeWire or Napster because <laughs> watching these Japanese dudes in this explosion match. And, like, you know, there's people who just come into this, watching this genre now that are just like, man, this this stuff's crazy. So it's, to me, it's just a whole nother boom from what kind of CCW and even FMW and even ECW kind of, like, started sparking just a little bit. In your opinion, Alex, why do you think some people choose to look down upon deathmatch wrestling? I mean, you have so many different genres of wrestling. You have the Japanese strong style, which is one way. Um, you have more of your Greco-Roman based mat wrestlers. You have your Lucha Libre. Um, you have your British style as well. But why is it, if you had to put your finger on it, do you think people just look at it as just gratuitous violence that isn't really an art form? Yeah. And do you think they truly have any understanding of really what goes into it some people do uh but there's a whole sector of fans uh the fans are, are kind of i feel like at least in this day and age fans with deathmatch wrestling are kind of split you'll have fans that that truly do appreciate at least whatever art form that that it is or at least they 
deem to presume it is. Um, and then you have a sector of fans that are kind of just into the gratuitous blood, the violence, the big, like, is this guy, I hope this guy gets hurt type mentality. And that's, I feel like that's not what it's about. I feel like it is, it is kind of an art form. And at least from what I do is, is I like to mold wrestling into the death matches. And, um, you know, it's not just about the big spots and the weapons. Like it's about at least trying to tell a story, if not a simple story and, and trying to mix in, uh, maybe some catch as catch can or some traditional technical wrestling, some high flying, uh, something other than two dudes smashing each other with, uh, with weapons, you know, and you just get, you just get different sectors of, uh, fans that kind of like have their thoughts on it. And that's where you get people who think, oh, this is just, it's just violence, you know? And that's a lot of the early stuff. The early stuff was just two guys just hitting each other with stuff. Because if you watch even like old, like uh, NWA cage matches and stuff, like the psychology wasn't built on being a technical wrestler. The psychology was dusty going in there with somebody. They're punching each other a lot. They're bringing chains out. It's they're red equals green, right? So yep. What? why is what we do any different from what they did? The only difference is they use that as a blow off. And sometimes we come in right away with that and we try to figure out how to build and ante it up even more so from what we did. So it's kind of more of a higher elevated version of what Dusty and some of those guys were doing in the 80s. So I don't sometimes I just don't understand the psychology of of, hey, what you guys do isn't what they did. Uh, it's not wrestling. Uh, it's it's exactly kind of the same thing they did, just a little bit more violent. No, I agree with you completely. Um, you had mentioned about this a little bit earlier. You said that when it comes to doing deathmatch wrestling, sometimes promoters, it, it may be hard to get on a show that's not necessarily deathmatch because you can still wrestle really well, and you did a lot of that, the majority of your early portion of your career. Um, do you feel like some people stay away from booking somebody because they may have the stigma of, their death match and they think, well, they really can't go any other uh, style. But in reality, a lot of these guys are just as versatile and just as good. Uh, it just happens to be death match is really what their passion is. Do you feel like that's ever hindered you as far as getting booked? Uh, I guess maybe sometimes I really don't think about it that hard, to be honest. I would think about it more from the flip side, like promoters are only wanting to book me because they see my deathmatch stuff. So that's what, <laughs> that's what they're seeking. Not more so, oh, are they not going to book me because all they see is deathmatch, but more so they, they want to book me for the deathmatch. But, uh, if it, if it comes to like stuff like TV or getting looks from, from outside companies overseas, or obviously it's gonna, it's gonna hinder me because a lot of the perception um, amongst uh, the general public is what we do is in wrestling. And that's why guys like me are doing the best to kind of change that perception. Um, you know, uh, maybe someday it'll change and, and that'll be something that could benefit deathmatch guys is to be looked at as professional wrestlers as a whole. But I feel like at least right now uh, you get your kind of your 50, 50 going on. I remember it's funny. You talked about, um, FMW. I saw a lot of the FMW stuff with Leatherface and Terry Funk did a bunch of stuff and Mick Foley did a bunch of stuff and it was it was very raw. It was different, but it still garnered an incredible audience and it was something that FMW was more of a tape trader thing. Um, back in the day, you, you had to get it from somebody who, who had a copy of it. But yeah, I, I remember that very, very vividly and it launched a lot of careers. I mean, let's think about it. If Mick didn't do half the stuff he did, would he necessarily have gotten the opportunity to do the mankind stuff? Because that's what attracted so many people was his anything goes type of style. So I feel like a lot of people still need to give credit to the FMWs and the GCWs because there is money in that and that can springboard people into, into other areas. I agree. Uh, every every style of wrestling has its appeal, and I feel like deathmatch wrestling does have an appeal. Um, and I feel like you, hopefully, maybe someday we could see a lot of deathmatch guys get an opportunity to be on a larger platform to be able to show that we could kind of uh, bring it to a, a TV level, and it's not just the indie like, oh, all we could do is just bleed a bunch. No, we we could do way more than that. It's just being given the opportunity to use our creativeness to uh you know sway the public into believing what we're doing is is what we do outside of the the viewer eyes you know 
Well, Alex, you know, you can wrestle, you can do deathmatch stuff, but recently I caught a promo you did, and it really, like, it really drew me in. 